Justice uh, Mrs. Manohar, Senior Counsel Rajni Ayer, friends. Welcome to this webinar organized by the interactive session of Lady Lawyers. We are a group of lady lawyers practicing in the High Court. We take up issues relating to women and interns. We also hold lecture series as well as this time we held an annual article writing competition. The topic for today is redefining the notions of equality and gender justice in India. Landmark judgments of the Supreme Court. When you think of this topic, the only name that comes to the mind is Justice Sujata Manohar. <laughs> she has many firsts to her name. She graduated with a first class honor from the Bombay University. She's an MA from Oxford University. And she's also a barrister at law from Lincoln Inn, London. She's the first Indian judge to be appointed as an honorary bencher of the Lincoln's in London. She has a lot. She has. She was appointed the first woman judge of the Bombay High Court, and the first woman Chief Justice, not only of the Bombay High Court, but also of the Kerala High Court. She was appointed as a judge of the Honorable Supreme Court in 1994. She was appointed as a member of the National Human Rights Commission in the year 2000. She was a chairperson of the Committee of Feminism and International Law of the International Law Association in 2010. She was a consultant to the United Nations Division for the Advancement of Women Expert, or Experts Group on Trafficking, as well as Women peace and security. She had been invited by the United Nations Division for security. Sorry, she was invited by the United Nations Division for the advancement of women to deliver lectures to African and Caribbean judges and also by the Indonesian Human Rights Commission to talk to Indonesian judges on the use of human rights in decision making. She was one of the first the three women invited from the world to speak on the 30th anniversary celebration of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women at the UN in the year 2009. Today, she's one of the most sought after arbitrators in national and international disputes. I could go on talking about all her achievements, but I think it will take days. So I am sure all of us would rather hear her than me. But before I begin, I would request our patron, Senior Counsel Ms. Rajni Ayer, to declare the names of the winners of the article writing competition and thereafter to pay tribute to one of our founders and core members and a very, very close friend, Ms. Josna Pandi, who passed away on Thursday. If during after our physical sessions, we all went back home with a smile on our face, it was not only because of the good lecture that we heard, but it was also because she ensured that we were all well fed. A request to all the participants to keep their videos and audio is closed. Question and answers will be taken up after the lecture. Those who wish to ask questions, there's a question icon at the side, on the left-hand side. You can press that and type your questions. Ma'am Rajni? Yes. Hello, friends. This has been a topic 12 weeks since the mid of March. But thanks to our interactive session, some of us have been able to put it to good use and apply our brains to a challenging subject on force majeure and the, its effect on limitation. We had about 24 persons who participated. These were first vetted by advocate Ms. Deepa Chavan, and thereafter, finally, by senior advocate Mr. Darius Kambatka. 
Mr. Kambata shared with me his admiration of the high standards of the essays that he had read and that he had difficulty in deciding the order of winners, in fact, in the last moment, and was wanting to change and did change and then rearrange the order of the winners. To use his words, he says the articles, the standards, and style of legal writing was both impressive and commendable. So much so that he says that he did something that he will always cherish and that he used one of the references in one of the articles that he read for some of his own legal work. Full praise to each of you participants. Good luck for the future. There are five winners. And if I may, as tradition demands, start with the fifth person. Each of you and each of your articles was given a number so that the identity of the person would not be known to either Ms. Deepa Chavan or to Mr. Dadayas Kambata. He chose the numbers in this order, starting five to one. The fifth place is in turn Ms. Makena Patia. A11. Second place, Advocate Swati Joglekar, A18. Third place, intern, Miss Nidisha Gag, A9. Second place, intern, Malaika Castellino, A14. And top of the pile, Advocate Ekta Varma at A6. Congratulations to each of you. Well done. Keep it up. As I said, this has been a torrid 12 weeks that all of us have faced since March. It's also an introduction to the torrid future that lay, uh, lies ahead of us starting Monday, whether in the trial course or in the high courts. The meeting of the interactive session of women advocates by video conferencing is not only indicative of this challenging period ahead of us, but also a very gentle or a forceful reminder that we have to say goodbye to the good and gentle that we had amongst us in the past when we return to work on Monday and to embrace the bold and digital world of the future. Earlier this week, our friend Jyotsna Ben Pandi bid us adieu. In her demise, the bar has lost a good, gentle, and ever smiling advocate, ready to interact with one and all and reach out to a new face or a new entrant at the bar and make them feel comfortable in a strange new place. I was often witness to the lunchtime bonhomie at her adjoining lunch table and her untiring efforts to make it a happy time for all, especially when friends were seen to be getting aggressive and or too demanding. Friends have written in to me mentioning to me about her journey and her grounding in the chambers of Mr. D.S. Pari. Now we know where her gentleness, her smile, her demeanor, all are grounded in. And her growth in the offices of Mrs. Puna and Kaiser, and her maturing as an independent practitioner, as also about her gentle presence her affable and ever helpful, studious nature, her reassuring counsel and kindness in matters in which she perhaps was not appearing, and her cooperative and helping hand even in matters where she was appearing. Friends, all of us remember Jyotsna then with happiness, fondness, and a smile. 
She was such an integral part of this interactive session group, looking after the finances and the hospitality details of each meeting hosted by the group. Her fondness for sweet, which someone let me into that secret, found expression in the snacks she served to us, as also in her deeds and actions towards others. Her zest for life led her to travel to distant places and to wear her 74 years of age so effortlessly and with such exemplary grace. Death is inevitable. But Josna Ben will be remembered. It will be difficult to forget her soft persona, her sweet smile, and her friendship and helping hands. Our condolences to each of her family members, as also to her family of children. May her soul rest in peace. <laughs> With this, we now start today's proceedings. And it is my delightful wish to ask Justice Mrs. Manohar to take over and address our gather. Thank you, Mrs. Manohar. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me to this program. Uh, we are meeting in very difficult times and we we'll probably have to get used to technical hitches and this kind of addressing uh, various gatherings, including courts and our colleagues. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about equality and gender justice and how the modern generation looks at it. Now, as you know, the movement for gender justice <clears throat> and women's equality has had to however, overcome many obstacles. Centuries of traditions, customs, and practices have denied to women the right to equality, freedom to choose, right to work outside the home, right to education, freedom to achieve professional recognition, as you might have experienced in some form or another, and a right to lead a life with dignity on a woman's own terms. Institutions, mindsets, laws, customs, and practices have developed around this notion of inequality and are difficult to dislodge. We have only partly succeeded in getting rid of this bondage. And in fact, as we remove some of the bondages, new obstacles to equality come to light. And that is why every generation has its own notions of gender equality and gender justice. Now, as you know, we have around the world a sprinkling of women leaders all over, but maybe some women prime ministers, some women chief justices, some women leaders of industry and so on. But there are several barriers which have still to be broken. I will only talk about some aspects of equality. Now, let us look at customs. In 1829, Sati was banned in India because of the efforts of Raja Ramo and Roy. But child marriages remained, although there was legislation against it. A woman could not have education. A Hindu woman had no right of inheritance and no right to property. Savitri Bai Phule, when she started a school for girls in 1848, was pelted with stones and cow dung. In other parts of the world, uh, in 1908, women in New York marched asking for voting rights. And our Cornelia Sorabji qualified in civil law from Oxford in 1892. And yet she had to wait for 27 years to join Lincoln's Inn and qualify as a barrister in 1922, only because she was a woman. She could join when Sex Discrimination Removal Act was passed in England. Then when she applied for enrollment as a barrister in Allahabad High Court in 1923, she was allowed to join, but she was advised 
to confine her practice to helping Vardhanashil women. Now, prior to her, the first woman who had really applied for enrollment in 1916 was Regina Guha, who applied to the Calcutta High Court for enrollment. She had passed her MA examination, standing first in the university, and she got Chancellor's Medal. But when she applied, the High Court constituted a full bench to consider her unusual application. And after examining women, the history of women legal practitioners came to the conclusion that there was no such thing and women were not known to be lawyers. So they declined her application. In the same year, in Patna High Court in 1923, Sudanshuwala Hazra also applied for enrollment as a pleader. The Patna High Court followed the Calcutta precedent rather than the Allahabad precedent, and she was also refused permission. But she had a patron in Madhusudan Dutt, who is known as the father of modern Orissa. And he canvassed her case right up to the governor general. And ultimately, in 1923, our Legal Practitioners Act was amended to permit women to enroll as lawyers. That is how in 1923, Mithala became the first woman barrister to enroll in our high court, Bombay High Court. Uh, and the rest, of course, is now history. Women have come a long way from those days. Nevertheless, there are, I'm afraid, still some problems. You must have heard of Navi Pillai, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. When she was talking about equality and justice in the courtroom, she observed, despite the decades of struggle for women's right to equality, judicial processes worldwide are often shot through with harmful gender stereotypes. And this can amount to a denial of a woman's right to justice by the very legal system that is supposed to protect fundamental human rights of everyone. Gender stereotypes wildly held beliefs about women's and men's supposed characteristics and proper roles are ubiquitous and create a deep vein of prejudice that affects the lives of women and men. This seriously affects their economic empowerment, the area that affects and controls many other aspects of empowerment, at the same time, we have also had some very heartwarming decisions from our judiciary and even from parliament setting up equality as a goal of legislation or judicial decision making. Now, when the Constitution of India as a new democracy was drafted, we put in the foremost position the right to equality and the all pervasive impact of this right is felt even now in the large number of petitions which are filed in the High Court and the Supreme Court where the right to equality is invoked. This right is accompanied by the right to non-discrimination on the ground of religion, race, caste, sex, etc. under Article 15. You are very familiar with these articles. At the same time, Article 15, 3 permits special provisions for women and children. This provision, in my view, is more in the nature of affirmative action in favor of women to strengthen their weak, weaker position so that they can attain equal status with men. And there are, of course, several specific positive provisions for equality, such as right to equal pay for equal work, right to adequate means of livelihood, right to health, shelter, right to maternity benefits, and so on. Basically, ensuring a life with dignity under Article 21. Now, this concept of special provisions to make unequals equal led to the principle of classification at the first stage of interpretation which was evolved by the Supreme Court 
in various cases you might have heard of charanjit lal choudhury or balsara or ram krishna dalmia cases in the 50s where it was the court held that a person can be classified depending upon his needs and common characteristics which are relevant for the purpose of legislation and on the basis of such differentiation law can make different provisions for different classes of people and this led to reservations in employment first under uh, a similar provision for backward classes and by parity of reasoning it has also led to reservations for women in employment as in the case of government of andhra pradesh versus vijay kumar as late as 1995 on the same basis yusuf abdul versus bombay in 1954 a challenge to section 497 of the indian penal code under article 151 was repelled by the supreme court by holding that this section was protected by article 153 so there are odd places where these sections are resorted to now making special provisions on the basis of sex took a curious turn in the case of air india international versus nargesh mirza you must all have heard about that case in 1981 i would like to say what it is about because it's quite interesting in that case air hostesses of air india challenged discriminating service conditions in respect of air hostesses the regulations provided that, that she could not get married before completing 4 years of service then they said that she had to resign if she became pregnant and further she could serve only till the age of 35 which could be extended up to 45 at the discretion of the employer now the court upheld the first regulation on the basis that air hostesses were normally recruited around the age of 19 and the ban against marriage would extend only till the age of 23 so according to the court this need not be considered as discriminated the ban against the court struck down however the other two regulations as arbitrary and unreasonable and therefore violative of article 14 curiously the court did not consider these conditions as discrimination on the ground of sex the court said that this was a sex based classification that is covered by the forgetting that it is precisely an unfavorable sex based classification that is covered by the term sex discrimination on the ground of sex but fortunately the condition were, were struck down using another limb of equality namely that these were arbitrary and unreasonable but it does leave a sense of dissatisfaction now let me come to the economic front where supreme court has struck down discriminatory service conditions against women for example you will be surprised to know that in 19 that there were there was a rule in orissa which disqualified women from being appointed as district judges on marriage now this rule was struck down in 1969 by the supreme court then in muthamma's case in 1959 a rule of the indian foreign service which required a woman member of foreign service to obtain a permission in writing of the government before marriage was struck down and the court also struck down a rule which required her to resign if the government was satisfied that her family and domestic commitments were likely to come in the way of her duties these rules are now fortunately gone thanks to the supreme court internationally of course there has been a substantial body of case law dealing with employment related discrimination against women 
It could be in the form of job related qualifications that discriminate against women. It can be unfavorable service conditions for women, not giving equal pay for equal work. Now, in order to check discriminatory pay scales on the ground, the job specifications are different from those for men. The court has evolved the concept of comparable worth of work. In Mackinnon McKenzie versus Audrey de Costa in 1987, the court said that in deciding whether the work is same or similar, one should take a broader view. Yet even now, we find that in the informal sector, especially for agricultural workers, women still get paid much less than men. And now let me come to our personal laws. I hope we have some time. Article 2F of CEDAW requires state parties to take all appropriate measures to modify or abolish existing laws, regulations, customs and practices which constitute discrimination against women. Article 13, one of our constitution deals with the existing laws at the commencement of the constitution, which were inconsistent with or in derogation of fundamental rights. Now, Article 31, 13, one says that such laws to the extent of such inconsistency shall be void. Article 13.2 deals with future legislation. It says that the state shall not make any law which takes away, takes away or abridges these fundamental rights. And Article 13.3 defines law to include inter alia customs or usage having the force of law. One should have thought that if existing personal laws or customs at the time of commencement of the Constitution violated any of the fundamental rights, it would be void under Article 13.1, read with Article 13.3. But courts interpreted Article 13.1 a little differently in the context of personal laws and held that any discrimination under personal laws would have to be removed only by legislative reforms. A judgment of our court delivered by two very distinguished judges, Justice Chagla and Justice Gajendra Gadkar. This was one of the earliest cases after the Constitution came into force. Uh, it challenged the validity of the Bombay Prevention of Bigamous Marriages Act 1946 on the ground that it was discriminatory because while polygamy was permitted to Muslims in the state of Bombay, the same practice made a Hindu liable to severe penalties. The plea was rejected. The court made a sharp distinction between religious faith and belief and religious practices. It held that state protected religious faith and belief, but if religious practices run counter to any of our fundamental rights or morality or public good, these can be amended, but, a le but legislation was required to amend these practices. Now, as, as you realize, this distinction between religious faith and belief on the one hand and religious practices on the other hand is a continuing subject of litigation even today. The Sabri Mala case is still being reconsidered by the Supreme Court. The right of Muslim women to pray in a mosque or the right of a Hindu woman to enter certain temples is still being litigated. It shows how difficult it is to eradicate by legislation alone or by decisions alone, deeply entrenched social or religious customs and traditions however discriminatory they may be. In this context, I think we must be thankful for the work done by the legislature and the judiciary just after independence in eliminating many discriminatory provisions 
by laws. The reform of Hindu law in the 50s was a remarkable achievement. It eliminated a lot of provisions in the old Hindu law, highly discriminatory against women. And the courts also interpreted these provisions in a liberal manner, eliminating discrimination as far as possible. You as lawyers are also aware how Christian law and Parsi law, as well as law of succession, has subsequently been amended to give women an equitable right of inheritance. You remember Mary Roy's case in 1986, where a Christian woman was given the right to inherit under the Indian Succession Act, rather than the unfavorable Travancore Kuchin Act. You are also familiar with a Muslim woman's right to maintenance and the turmoil caused by the Shah Banu case. The last case points out the difficulty of changing personal laws and religious practices in the light of equality and protection against gender discrimination. Also, equality is not just non-discrimination. It has a positive content. It implies access to a life with dignity, ability to access food, shelter, healthcare, education, training, economic opportunities, maternal benefits, etc. And now in the context of migrants, we are again made conscious of these positive obligations of the state. As new and previously unknown forms of discrimination arise, as in the case, for example, of sex selection of an unborn baby, new laws need to be on the statute book to prevent and punish such practice. Old value systems are difficult to get rid of, and they continuously need to be replaced by new systems which give aspirations of the new generations. In essence, we are living in an era of transition from a society based on old values to a new and modern society that respects human rights. There are many countries which put international human rights treaties above the local laws, customs, and traditions. I will give you a case from Africa. In the case of uh, in Botswana, there is the case of Unity Dao versus the Attorney General, where the Court of Appeal struck down the provisions of the country's nationality law under which a Botswana woman married to a non-national could not pass her nationality to the children of the marriage, while the man could. The court held that this was wrong, and she could also pass her nationality to the children. In contrast, the European Court of Human Rights, for example, held in the case of Abdul Aziz Bal Kandali versus the United Kingdom, that the United Kingdom law, which differentiated between women who wish to bring their husbands into Britain and husbands who wish to bring their wives into Britain was wrong and discriminatory. The United Kingdom replied by reducing the rights of husbands to bring their wives to the country. So we have to be always vigilant and see which way the uh, benefit lies. Lastly, I want to just conclude by emphasizing uh, another concept of equality, which is concerned with gender justice. Violence is now looked upon, not just as a crime, but as a denial of human rights, especially violence, which targets women because they are women. Violence need not be only physical, it can be psychological, and it prevents young women from access to education. It makes it difficult for women to avail of job opportunities. Domestic violence can be a grave threat. Other forms of violence, such as rape, at times gruesome rape accompanied by murder, now raise a demand for gender justice. 
you must be remembering Jessica Lal murder case, Virbaya rape and murder case, the Hyderabad gang rape case in recent times. And I would also like to remind you of dowdy deaths, which are still common. They all resonate with cry for gender justice. So these are the few things I leave you with some thought. Uh, I will only remind you of uh, Vishakha judgment of which I was a party, uh, where we held that sexual harassment, which is also a form of violence, is a violation of human rights. And we can use international treaties to fill gaps in our domestic law. So here are some aspects that I have touched upon. It is a vast subject with a vast body of case law. And I hope some of you will analyze some of these cases to see how we can improve our own system. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The lecture was really enlightening. What's I happening? must say, it seems to be from the outside. OK. Uh, I'm very grateful you've taken us from the journey from Kuniga Sorabdi till today, going to dealing with the Chabri Malai case. And uh, I still feel that the struggle is still on. Women have not really, up to now, reached what they actually deserve. Of course. Uh, there is one question. What are your views on the Me Too movement? Uh, basically, I look upon it more as a social movement rather than a legal movement. Because it shows that women who were earlier unable to express their difficulties and the harassment which they had suffered because they were under social pressure can now express their anguish and their difficulties because there is a more permissive atmosphere. But I don't know how far one can go with legally prosecuting somebody for having done something long time back. If you have good evidence, perhaps. But otherwise, I think basically, but it is a very useful thing because women are now coming out, voicing their resentment against violence of any form. So I would say that it's, it's, it's a mixture of social uh, expression of gender discrimination at the same time. It may some of some of it may have legal implications, but not all. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is whether do you think there's any scope for misuse of this movement? Of course, anything can be misused. And in our country, you can take it that any good thing is likely to be misused. But what you have to stop is misuse. Don't stop the whole thing. <laughs> Don't stop what is good because it can be misused. That is a likelihood of misuse, of course. Uh, the next question is whether time has come for the judiciary to take a positive step for ensuring equality for women by applying reservation for women in the judiciary. That I don't know whether you think that would be good or not. Because once you start reservations, then there are various other sections also who would also like reservations. I think in the judiciary, by and large, it is meant to do justice to all kinds of cases which come before it. We must have people on merit. What you can do is to say that there will not be any prejudice against selection of any particular person because of sex or caste or whatever. But I am all for selections on merit. Basically, I think reservation is a very short term uh, method of getting over prejudices of the past. It can't be a permanent or a long term method because it is in a sense denial of equality. You do you justify it because there is so much inequality at present that you can't 
just overcoming my affirmative action, you need to have a reservation. But for how long? I don't think it would be fair to encourage this kind of uh, reservation. I, 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 I it, 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 it. Ma'am, a little taking this a little ahead. What about uh, reservation as far as senior council gowns are concerned? Because today we see that the ratio of lady seniors is very, very little in comparison to the men. Yes, what I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes, that is, I'm sorry to see this. Uh, but what can I say? Uh, we probably need to have proper norms. Have you got any norms laid down as to who should be appointed a senior advocate? Because you see, women may be disadvantaged in some ways because if they want certain criteria of income or case law, uh, how much cases, how many cases you have handled, and so on, women may be at a disadvantage. So I think we have to have uh, other criteria also. I have not thought about it, so I really can't say. But I think as women lawyers, you should sit together and see how you can uh, lay down proper criteria for selection. Is it just income or just number of cases or is it the quality of arguments that you advance? And what do you look at? Something has to be worked out. I can't say offhand. Very true, ma'am. I think we should look at the quality of the arguments in the very in the cases that the women argue rather than the number and the economic conditions of it. Right. Ma'am, there's, there's one more question. Is there something that can be done to improve the social fabric and affect the social engineering? Sorry, I didn't understand that. Something I think that this basically is dealing with whether the judiciary can help in improving the social fabric when it comes to women. Oh, of, of course it can, because it is doing that, in fact, when cases come before it. But it has its limitations. I mean, the judiciary can do something in cases which come before it. In looking at cases, in appreciating evidence, in various ways judiciary can do to improve social fact. Certainly. And it should. But, I mean, but you can't expect judiciary to lay down the law. And that is that is a problem. I think they can so only sometimes, do. <laughs> sometimes it is done, but, <laughs> but not as a normal course. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I think there are not too many questions. I, that's the last question. Your lecture was so so enlightening and so clear. I don't think there were questions that people had in their mind. You were very very clear in your concepts. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, may I call upon Saloni Gole to give the word of thanks? Thank, thank, you, thank, thank you very you, much. Ma thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes. Today, as we all gathered to discuss on the topic of the notions of equality and gender justice, I, I believe many of us joined me in the sentiment of wondering whether the ideas of equality and gender justice remain to be notional yet today. However, the work of Justice Mrs. Manohar and her guidance, her inspiring words have, have, have in fact guided us through in, in believing that the glass ceiling can be shattered, albeit the road may be a little way to long. However, that can be done. We, your works, ma'am, has been a guiding force to us. Continue to guide us, inspire us. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. And I would be only faithful. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I held up the whole thing for a long time. I, I'm not a technically savvy person. <laughs> No, no. In fact, in fact, like like uh, Miss Rajni Ayer was also saying that it is a guiding, it is a learning curve for all of us to see how the efforts could function. So we all we all are learning under your guidance, ma'am. What what all could be the difficulties coming forward that we all have we all have to take note of. 
and, and i would also be failing in my difficult uh, failing in my duty if i do not acknowledge that uh, our patron uh, senior advocate ms rajni ayer has been guiding us and also has guided us through the paper writing the essay writing process of force majeure and uh, limitations and also our organizer advocate anita castellino who has been a binding force to the organization and has as many visions for for what many ideas how how a female advocate could groom herself and we are really thankful for that thank you very much and thank you so much to the platform itself yes okay. madam madam thing you put the uh, essays on the website or somewhere where we can access them it would be nice to look at all the essays which you receive at least the prize winning ones absolutely in fact in fact i presume that was the idea that to get the essays published in either of the uh, leading leading magazines law magazines where, where they could be referred for some time and remain on record so mm -hmm. i'm sure i am sure the uh, interactive session is working on it as well and we have okay. we have taken we have taken that advice on record thank thank you very much ma'am once again and also thank you very much to the platform who has enabled in making this entire interaction possible in, in the times of lockdown and and with that i pray that we all come out with with lot of health and prosperity and, and make make the wheels of justice running assist in the process so have a great day to everyone thank you very much